All right. Hi, everyone. I hope you had a great weekend. I am very sick. I have COVID, which I managed to go three and a half years without getting it, but I got it and I don't feel so great. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I stumble on my words. I'm just not feeling great by any means. So just some reminders is that your project drawdown final project is due Monday, September 11th. You will submit that to a discussion forum, which I have posted. I have opened that up on the Canvas page. The idea is that you'll post your project, whatever form you chose to do it in, to a thread, and then I will assign you so many of your peers to watch, engage, read, however you will do that, and uh, submit a, an activity after you watch or engage with their projects. And you'll do that on Tuesday, kind of as if you were to have a final exam, but it will be asynchronous. You can do it on your own time, and that'll just be due uh, by Wednesday. Now, the Canvas quiz was really irritating me because I went back and checked that question about the sea ice formation multiple times. And on my end, it had the right answer selected as the correct answer, but it was grading it incorrectly. And I apologize for that. I will go back through, it's on my to-do list to grade that one. But sea ice formation does increase ocean salinity because the salt does not freeze with the ice, it gets ejected as brine. And so that creates super salty water beneath the sea ice. And I apologize again, it's very frustrating when the technology does not work. Your homework number two is due tonight. And then your homework number three, um, which is on the carbon cycle and on carbon dioxide uh, is open now. Okay, so let's spend some time looking at this figure. So what is this showing us? And oops, let me see if I can pull this over a little bit. Let's spend about, I don't know, 90 seconds looking at this. What are you looking at here? All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the top graph here is showing the fossil fuel and cement carbon dioxide emissions. So fun fact is that cement, you, uh, the production of cement uh, is a huge contributor to carbon dioxide emissions. Each of the shadings is the different source. So we can see the contributors through time. The main contributor is coal, followed by oil. 
And so we can see, you know, really the ramp up in the 1930s and 40s with our uh, production and our usage of these, these resources. The bottom panel is showing the anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions and where those emissions are going. Okay, so on the top, here's the fossil fuel and cement in gray, and then also land use change. So when we tear down trees, when we deforest the rainforest, that is taking away a sink of carbon dioxide, which means we're, in theory, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere because we've taken away that natural process, that natural feedback. And so land use change can impact CO2. And then on the bottom here, it shows you where those CO2 emissions are going in the Earth system. So the green is land. So the land is taking some up. The trees will take some up. The light blue is the atmosphere. So some of that carbon dioxide is going into our atmosphere. And we've seen that in our healing curve, that Mauna Loa CO2 record. And then the dark blue is our ocean. So our oceans are taking up a lot of the extra CO2 as well. Okay, so this is looking at carbon. And because we are going to talk about carbon a lot today and Thursday, we're going to kind of start to bring it all together and talk about this really important feedback and this important cycle in our Earth system, which is um, the carbon cycle. And so I don't know what happened to my check mark, but we talked about the atmosphere, we talked about water, hydrosphere, we talked about the cryosphere. Now we're going to move in to these two, the biosphere and geosphere where carbon is moving around in our climate system. So we're going to talk a little bit about geology today, just because it's important to note um, where we're moving carbon and the solid earth, the geology is important. Um, we'll talk about volcanoes because volcanoes do play an important role in our climate system, especially on very long term time periods, say millions of years. We'll talk about steady state and residence time for different fluxes in our earth system. So our Earth has many layers. So if you cut into Earth and were to look at it like a cake, we have layers. We, you and I, are living on the crust, so the outermost layer. But we also have the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. Very hot inside our core. There's two types of crust on our planet. We have continental crust and oceanic crust. Now, the differences in density are really important between these two crusts. So the continental crust is very light, it's low density as compared to oceanic crust. And this is important because these crusts will interact at what are known as plate boundaries or tectonic plate boundaries. And that is going to uh, lead us to volcanoes, okay? So our continent is made of granite, less dense, and it's quite thick, 20 miles thick. Our ocean, is mainly made up of basalt, it's much more dense, and it is thin. And as I mentioned, the density difference matters. Now our Earth is super warm on the inside, okay? This extra heat energy inside our core is going to drive what's happening on Earth's surface. So looking at this graph here, what is the temperature in Earth's inner core? And temperature is shown on the x-axis, and depth is shown on the y-axis. <laughs> it's okay. Yes, this one is always, I've actually taught the same one twice today already. And uh, this one, every, everyone always chooses the wrong one in this. So when we look at this, right, again, looking at data and graphs, the x-axis at the top here is temperature. The x, the y-axis is depth. So if we're trying to get the temperature of the inner core, the inner core is 6,000 kilometers deep, but the actual temperature is 5,000. Okay, so 5,000 degrees Celsius, very, very hot. And that heat 
coming from inside the Earth's core is going to set up convection currents inside the mantle. Okay, so we have the crust on Earth's surface, we have the mantle in between, and we have the core. Okay, so just like we talked about convection in the atmosphere, where warm stuff rises, in our core, that extra heat is going to warm up the mantle material, which moves like a soft solid, like a Play-Doh. And that will rise up and create this area on Earth's surface where new mantle material is, or excuse me, new new magma or new crust is being formed, okay? And then these convection currents are going to pull the crust apart, okay? It's actually pulling the crust apart. And if we're pulling crust apart, then we're also bringing it together at certain points too. And this is happening on Earth's surface all the time. It's a very slow process, uh, but it's really important for the carbon cycle. So plate tectonics is this idea that the Earth's crust is broken into these rigid plates, these pieces, like these puzzle pieces, that are interacting with each other at boundaries. And that movement of these rigid plates or puzzle pieces is driven by that mantle convection, that heat from the core. The core is as hot as our sun, and all that heat is trying to escape. And the continents are slowly drifting all the time, OK? And it's about a few centimeters per year. But after millions of years, that adds up. And so this idea of continental drift came about in the early 1900s by a scientist and meteorologist called Alfred Wegener. And he proposed this idea that the continents were slowly drifting. And the way he thought about this is he had some pieces of evidence to indicate that the continents were moving apart over time. One is that it appeared that the continents fit together like puzzle pieces. So for example, South Africa, excuse me, South America and Africa, you could kind of put them together and it looks like maybe at one point in time they were connected. He also showed that there were matching fossils on land masses that are now really far apart. And if you have land animals, animals that only live on land, and you find their fossils on multiple continents that are now separated by large oceans, that tells you that those continents had to have been closer together at some point in time. He also found and showed that there were matching rocks and structures on the edge of continents. So for example, the Appalachian Mountains in North America, the British Isles, and the Caledonia Mountains, those all are of the same geologic material. They are the same mountain range, but now they're separated by an ocean. And he also showed uh, evidence from fossils and, and rocks that the climate zones do not match their current continent positions. He found that there were evidence of glaciers in places that were no longer glaciated or no longer in cold places like India, South Africa, Southern Australia, and Southern South America. And so this evidence he used to say, hey, it looks to me like these continents are moving apart. But he didn't really have a mechanism to explain how they were moving apart. Now, it's important to note a single lithospheric plate can have both oceanic and continental crust on it, or just one of each. Okay, so when we look at these cross sections, um, you can have continental crust or oceanic crust. Mm, sorry, I just saw your question. The last, what I was talking about uh, after the poll was why, where's the heat source? The heat source is coming from our core that creates convection currents in the mantle, just like convection currents in the atmosphere, which are gonna drive the motion of the Earth's plates because there's under the Earth's surface in the mantle, we have these convection currents that are moving and slowly pulling the plates apart and pushing them together. Sorry, I just I just saw that. Okay, now, Alfred Wegener, that was 1915 when he said, I think these continents are drifting apart. Here's my evidence, pieces of evidence. 
It wasn't until the 1950s, though, that we figured out what the mechanism was that was driving the motion, right? I just told you what it is, but he didn't know that, right? And we have evidence for that now. Uh, and the way we figured out the evidence for plate tectonics was by studying our ocean as a consequence of the Cold War. So we weren't like going down there to be like, I just want to study the ocean for fun uh, or for science. It was a little bit to do with the fact that we were nervous about submarines and enemies in our oceans. And so using sonar, uh, we were able to map the ocean bathymetry or the depth. So sonar is sound waves. You send the sound waves down off the ship and we know the speed of sound in water and how long it takes for that sound wave to return back to the ship allows us to calculate the depth. And what we found is that there was a mountain range or a ridge that ran through every ocean basin, basically underwater mountains. And we also found really deep parts of our ocean near the continents, we call those trenches. And so that was what we discovered here uh, with some of our ocean measurements. And that was important because it helped explain the idea that the oceans were dynamic, that we were seeing ridges of new warm oceanic crust in the center and older, denser crust on the edges. And so this is the idea of seafloor spreading, the idea that those convection currents in the mantle are creating new crust in the center of our oceans and pulling the crust apart and allowing for our oceans to spread, seafloor spreading. So it took about 30 years, 40 years really, 50, 30 years, um, for the theory of plate tectonics to take shape once we had this evidence to show that the oceans in fact were spreading apart it confirmed Alfred Wegener's hypothesis of continental drift. And so when we think about plate tectonics, there's three types of boundaries. These tectonic plates can do a few things. They can either spread apart, which is diverge, they can converge, come together, or they can transform or slide past each other. So divergent boundaries are Constructive, they are forming new crust, mainly forming new oceanic crust. The plates are moving apart. And the reason for this is that we have that heat flow from upwelling magma via those convection currents in our mantle. There's two types of divergent boundaries, um, ocean, ocean, oceanic crust, oceanic crust at a mid-ocean ridge. Now, before you even get a mid-ocean ridge, you start with an intracontinental boundary. Intracontinent meaning within the continent, which is known as a rift valley. So millions and millions of years ago, when Earth had just one giant continent known as Pangaea, what started to happen is some of that upwelling warm magma in the mantle started to push up and started to thin and pull apart the crust, the continental crust, at like a weak spot. And then it kept pulling and pulling and pulling, and the continental crust became thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually pulled apart. And water loves to find the lowest lying area and will fill in that, that valley. And then after many more millions of years, that linear sea is now an ocean. So all of our oceans on our planet today once started as intracontinental rift valleys. Okay, so our divergent boundaries, our mid-ocean ridges are these underwater volcanic mountains where new oceanic crust is forming. And if we are spreading apart plates, they have to be coming together somewhere else. So we have these mountains along the mid-ocean ridge, and we have these deep valleys on the edges which are known as trenches. So the deepest parts of our ocean are found at the trenches 
where we are recycling some crustal material back into the mantle. It melts and becomes gooey molten earth again. Um, oops. So as I mentioned, a rift valley is the early stage of a mid-ocean ridge. Okay, so today on our planet, we have an active intracontinental rift valley in Africa. So this is the Red Sea, Arabian Peninsula, and then the continent of Africa. The continent is slowly being ripped apart. So right now we have a linear sea here, but over a million years from now, that ocean will fill and it'll be an even bigger ocean. And those two land masses will be separated uh, by a bigger ocean. So our next major ocean on our planet is forming before our eyes. Then we have convergent boundaries, okay? Convergent means come together. These are destructed. These are where we are recycling earth material, earth's crust, or we're forming giant mountains. And at these locations, we're gonna get volcanoes and earthquakes because earthquakes are really the shaking of earth where the crusts are sliding past each other or into each other. There's three types of convergent boundaries on our planet, and it's due to the crust that are interacting. So we can have oceanic crust interacting with continental crust, call that ocean continental convergent. We have oceanic crust and oceanic crust interacting, and we have continental and continental crust. Now, what's happening at these convergent boundaries is the more dense tectonic plate is going to descend beneath the less dense. Okay, this idea of density, again, is being brought up again. More dense sinks beneath. And oceanic material is more dense. Oceanic crust is more dense than continental crust. And so when you have this boundary, what happens is the force of the oceanic crust and the continental crust pushing together creates this buckling of the Earth's surface, which is this trench, this really deep spot on the Earth's surface. And then that lithospheric plate subducts. It goes beneath the continental plate. Now, as that plate moves deeper into the mantle, the temperature rises, right? We saw that temperature increases as you move further towards the core. And what's going to happen is that mantle material starts to melt and rises up because it's less dense, it's warmer and less dense. And we end up with volcanoes on the non-subducting plate. Okay, so we get these volcanoes on our non-subducting plate. We call that a volcanic arc. Okay, in a transform boundary, the plates are sliding past each other. In California, we're very familiar with this. This is the San Andreas Fault. So in the San Andreas Fault, the North American plate is moving southward and the Pacific plate is moving northward. They're just sliding past. But there's a lot of friction. You know, we're talking about crust and earth material and it's sliding slowly and you can get earthquakes. We do get earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault. Now, these are not constructive or destructive per se. We're not creating new crust, really not destroying crust either. You're not gonna find volcanoes along transform boundaries. The only location you're gonna find volcanoes are along convergent destructive boundaries because what volcanoes are is the recycling of earth material. So we're taking crustal material either in the top example, ocean to continental, or the middle example, ocean to ocean, that crustal material melts and then rises back up. So volcanoes are a way that our Earth system is producing new crustal material. It is a closed system in that sense. We are taking older crust, 
melting it and creating new crust via volcanoes. Okay, so we look at earthquakes on our planet. Earthquakes are associated with play boundaries. We do have earthquakes not at play boundaries though, because the earth is so dynamic. It's constantly in motion that even inland, away from a boundary, we can have earthquakes. It's just where the earth is sliding. Volcanoes, if we look at the distribution of the largest volcanoes on our planet, you'll notice they are along boundaries. The big one is the Pacific plate here. And this is because along the Pacific plate, we have many convergent boundaries. So in North America, we have the Juan de Fuca plate. It is subducting beneath the North American plate. So it's an oceanic crust subducting under continental crust. So we're producing volcanoes. And we have the Aleutian Islands, the Marianas Trench. All of these places are very um, volcanic. All of this matters because volcanoes are a way that we're recycling that crustal material. Okay, so the ring of fire is the name that we give to the plate boundary pretty much around the Pacific Ocean where a lot of earthquakes and volcanoes occur because the Pacific plate uh, is a big oceanic plate that is subducting at many locations around that area. Okay, so as mentioned, earthquakes are a sudden and violent shaking of the ground, sometimes causing great destruction. And movement is always occurring along what's known as a fault. And a fault is just a fracture in Earth's crust where rocks are sliding past one another. And you can see these in real life. It's not, you know, they're, they're not like hidden always. They're out there. So for example, here's an outcrop and you can see the fault is like right here. And this piece of rock has moved up and this piece of rock has moved down. So these rocks are moving. Now, the reason this all matters is really due to the volcanism. Okay, the reason we have volcanoes on our planet is because of the fact that our plates are moving always and some are coming together and then we're recycling crustal material. Now, volcanoes are an important component of the carbon cycle because when we look at some of the gases in the volcanic gas, what's coming out of a volcanic eruption, we see that a lot of it is water vapor, which is a greenhouse gas. We also see that there's some carbon dioxide, there's sulfur dioxide, and some other stuff. Volcanoes are a natural flux of carbon dioxide from our solid earth, our geosphere, to the atmosphere. There's also a bunch of other stuff coming out, right? So we have ash that can lead to acid rain. We also have a lot of particles, you can see them designated here with these circles, that impact Earth's albedo. So after a large volcanic eruption, the temporary increase in albedo actually can impact Earth's temperature. So what do you think? Volcanoes cause global warming, true or false? All right, so volcanoes do not cause global warming. They actually cause global cooling temporarily. And that is because of the increase in albedo from some of the aerosols, those solid particles that are suspended in the atmosphere. So again, big of eruptions, a lot of that ash can make it all the way up even into the stratosphere, that second layer where the ozone layer is. 
and temporarily increase the planetary albedo. But that increase in albedo, as I get, it's very temporary. It's only about one to two years. So if we look at this graph here, and I apologize, it's very pixelated, but I took it from an old research paper. The x-axis here is the change delta, so delta, change in temperature of the surface, and time after the volcanic eruption. Okay, so zero is the eruption. And we see that for several years after an eruption, with the peak being about one, two years, one to two years after, there is a temporary cooling of the Earth's surface from large volcanic eruptions because of the increase in reflective aerosols that increase Earth's albedo. And again, here's another one showing some big volcanoes over time. So in 1880s, the 1880s, Krakatoa, a very large volcanic eruption in Indonesia, you could see Earth's temperature dropped for a few years after. Santa Maria, another big one in early 1900s dropped. Even in the 1990s, Pinatubo, the eruption, we can see a temporary drop. Okay, so we think about volcanoes on climate. It's not that they increase warming, they actually temporarily cool. So there's been some geoengineering, this idea that we could send volcanic ash into the atmosphere to cool the planet, but obviously it's not perfect, it's not foolproof in the sense that volcanic ash has other implications for our planet. It can impact agriculture, it can impact sunlight, right? So it's not perfect, but volcanoes are a way that carbon is moved around the Earth's system, okay? Volcanoes are in fact likely responsible for the formation of Earth's early atmosphere. So in the very beginning, Earth was a molten ball of lava, of magma, with no water, with no oceans. But over time, through plate tectonics and volcanism, a quite a bit of water vapor got released through the volcanic gas emissions, which allowed us to have liquid water on our planet and helped with the greenhouse effect. Now, when we look at volcanic eruptions, yes, there is CO2 that comes out, carbon dioxide that's coming out of volcanoes. But we compare global volcanic emissions to other sources of carbon dioxide, they are minor. For example, if we look at this line here, vol global volcanic emissions, about 0.26 gigatons per year of CO2. When we compare that to the anthropogenic CO2 from fossil fuel combustion in 2015, that number is 32.6. So it's like, what, 30 times 4, 120 times greater. So yes, it is a small contributor to carbon in the atmosphere, but very minor when we compare it to the other fluxes today. Okay. So really quickly, the difference between a mineral and a rock. Minerals are naturally occurring inorganic solids with internal molecular structures. And they have a specific chemical composition, meaning they have a chemical formula. Rocks are aggregates or multiple minerals combined. Okay, so for example, a piece of granite, which is a rock, is made up of quartz, feldspar, and mica minerals. Again, for a mineral to be considered a mineral, it has to be naturally occurring, inorganic, not living, it has to be solid. It has to have an internal molecular structure and a chemical, specific chemical composition. So when we think about our elements on our planet, we have our periodic table of elements, they combine to create minerals. For example, diamond is just a bunch of carbon atoms combined. But other minerals like olivine have a bunch of different elements. Then our minerals make up our rocks. Now, our planet is constantly evolving, constantly changing. We have the rock cycle, which you may remember from a while back. Our rocks are constantly changing. And carbon 
carbon dioxide, carbon is being moved around through our rocks and minerals on our planet. Okay, just a fun one here. Which one of these is a mineral? Is it ice, mercury, or sugar? All right, when we think about the definition of a mineral, it has to be solid, inorganic. Well, mercury is not a solid. Whoops, okay, mercury is a liquid in this case, in this example. Inorganic, not alive. Sugar comes from living things. Sugar cane, a plant. Ice is a mineral by definition because it is naturally occurring. It's inorganic, it is a solid, it has an ordered internal molecular structure and a chemical formula of H2O. So another cool thing about water. Okay, so minerals are forming our rocks. There are several thousand minerals on our planet, more than 4,000, and all rocks are a combination of minerals. And the composition of the different minerals make up that type of rock. And we're not gonna get into any more detail than this, just it matters because many of those minerals have carbon in them. Okay, so three types of rocks on our planet. Igneous rocks are formed by the cooling and crystallization of magma. Sedimentary rocks are formed when particles are transported by water, wind, or ice and combined or through the chemical precipitation of dissolved material. So if you have very, very calcite rich or solution, a water solution with a lot of a mineral in it, it can fall out of solution and create a rock. And the metamorphic rocks are igneous or sedimentary rock or even metamorphic rock that are changed as a result of high temperatures, pressures, and a combination of both. Now, the rocks can be broken up into pieces. And an example of this type of weathering, so weathering is the breaking up of rock, is chemical weathering. Okay, chemical weathering is the decomposition or breaking up of rock through chemical reaction. A really great example of this is water dissolves CO2, carbon dioxide, and becomes acidic, and it's carbonic acid. Carbonic acid can dissolve rock material, and it will carry that rock material through rivers into the ocean, where then that rock gets stored for many millions of years. Okay, so weathering, rock weathering, is a way that we can move carbon around our planet. And this is actually a really important one. Chemical weathering is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The rates of chemical weathering typically increase with temperature. So if we complete this feedback loop, if our global temperature increases and our rates of chemical weathering or breaking down of rocks via chemical reactions increases, that's a positive feedback, then the amount of chemical weather, yeah, the amount of chemical weathering increases, it's going to decrease the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Because what's happening is that CO2 is reacting with water and then it's basically staying in the solid earth it's not staying in the atmosphere anymore. So that's a negative coupling. 
And then if carbon dioxide decreases, then our global temperatures decrease. Okay, so that's a positive coupling. And this ends up being a negative feedback loop, kind of the first one we've really seen. So the rock cycle, the breaking up of rock material through chemical weathering is one way the Earth system has kind of built in a built-in negative feedback to help remove some of the carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. All right, so the big thing here is that chemical weathering is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And we're not gonna get into all the, the, the nuts and bolts of this, but all you really need to know is this is called the carbonate silicate cycle. And this is a very long term. It takes millions of years, but through volcanism and through that chemical weathering, we are moving carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and back into the solid earth. Then we also have physical breaking up of rocks. So physical weathering is breaking the rocks into smaller pieces. Some examples of this can be through biologic activity, uh, like root wedging. So trees, their roots will break open rock. We also have frost wedging where water gets into the cracks in rock. And when water freezes, it expands in volume and it pushes the rock apart, cracks it open. And then uh, biological activity, more so with animals, where you have things like prairie dogs that dig channels underground and they're moving earth material. And all of this increases the rate of weathering, even chemical weathering, because then you are exposing more surface area of the rock. So you need physical weathering to help with chemical weathering. Okay. So weathering is the breaking up of rock. We have erosion, which is the movement of rock from point A to point B. So you can't erode rock until you've weathered it. And erosion is done by things like wind, water, and ice, all kind of due to gravity. Gravity is moving the rock material around our planet. Sedimentary rock is formed by the cementation and compaction of sediment. Some of the most iconic images of rocks are sedimentary rocks. So here's like Arches National Park. They can be clastic or chemical. Clastic meaning small pieces of rock like sandstone and chemical meaning rock that has formed from a solution. So it's formed from dissolved material in lakes and oceans. When conditions change, the material precipitates out of that solution or falls out of the liquid to form chemical sediments like salt. For example, when our tide pools, those shallow waters evaporate out. Organisms can also precipitate material to form their shells and skeletons. Some of the common types of chemical sedimentary rocks are like limestone. It's made of calcium carbonate. And I emphasize carbonate because there's carbon in it. And it's where we're going to store a lot of carbon in our Earth system is in our oceans. A lot of carbon, critters take up the carbon, and we form large chunks, huge amounts of, of underwater rock underwater limestone, okay? Sedimentary rocks are really cool to look at because they have layers like a cake. And each layer tells a story about that time in Earth's history. And if you wanna look at this more, you can click on this and check it out. But each type of sedimentary rock is formed in a different environment. And so that tells us how the environment's changed through time. Sedimentary rocks are the rock type that will contain fossils. If a fossil were to exist, you would find it in a sedimentary rock. And fossils are the remains and traces of ancient life. And it can be, you know, fossils could be 
not just the bones, but also things like footprints, um, leaves, petals, stems of plants. Okay. And metamorphic rocks form from the sedimentary and igneous rocks that have undergone heat and pressure change. And you get some really cool rock features here, like this one in Yosemite National Park, where we have some really cool bends and, and folds in the rocks. So limestone, as I mentioned, which is a chemical sedimentary rock, can undergo heat and pressure changes, can metamorphosize to become marble. So marble is commonly used as a building agent, right? The Taj Mahal is made out of marble. Marble is a metamorphic rock. It is made from limestone, calcium carbonate. Okay, so marble is another rock type that is storing a large amount of carbon on our Earth system. Okay, all of this comes together as the rock cycle. And I know I went really fast here, but the point of this is honing in on the carbon, right? That carbon is being moved around in our rock cycle. We have igneous rock, sedimentary rock, and metamorphic rock, and they're constantly going back and forth. Our plate tectonics are recycling earth material, creating new fresh magma that is leading to volcanic eruptions, and that's adding CO2 carbon to our atmosphere, or you know, weathering is taking it away. So all together, we get our carbon cycle. Okay, we've talked about carbon in our atmosphere. We've talked about it in our oceans. And we just talked about our rock cycle. We also talked, you know, a little bit about photosynthesis. And, you know, plants take up carbon. And we can put all of this together to really think about how human activities are changing this cycle from its natural state and what that means for our future. Carbon is the life element. All life is based on carbon. You and I, we have a lot of carbon in our bodies. And CO2, carbon dioxide, is an important greenhouse gas. We talked about how it impacts planetary temperature. And carbon impacts the ocean through nutrient cycling, how much nutrients there are available for life in the ocean, and it impacts ocean acidity as well, and we'll talk about that in a bit. There are two types of carbon, big picture. Inorganic carbon is that that is not associated with living organisms, like rock. Then we also have inorganic car or excuse me, organic carbon, which is associated with living organisms like trees, animals, you and me, we are made up of organic carbon. So which of these represents or depicts organic carbon? All right, organic carbon meaning living of life. So our tree here is organic, which in this sense, in chemistry, it means something completely different than like the grocery store, right? When you go to the grocery store and something's called organic, that doesn't mean it's of life because everything is organic in terms of food. That is a completely different nomenclature. Now we're gonna bring back or, uh, reservoirs and fluxes. So we talked about reservoirs and fluxes before. But remember, reservoirs are where something is stored for long periods. So in our carbon cycle, we have some major reservoirs of carbon. Some of our major reservoirs of carbon are the atmosphere, the ocean, fossil carbon, 
like that coal that we've dug up and used for energy, soil, our plants on land, our rocks. And the fluxes are the movement of that material, that carbon between different reservoirs. Okay, what I'd like you to do for a minute is think about these reservoirs of carbon. And I want you to list them from smallest to largest. What is the smallest reservoir of carbon on our planet? And what is the largest? I give you about a minute here. Okay, what do you think is the smallest carbon reservoir? Which one of these? Okay, so smallest sedimentary rock, okay, and largest deep ocean, okay? Anyone else? What do you think the smallest is? Vegetation, okay. permafrost. Okay. So when we look at our reservoirs, this, I like this one because it's just a visual. When we look at our carbon reservoirs, the major reservoirs, our lithosphere, which is the rock, is huge. <laughs> it is 100 million gigatons of carbon. Our oceans are a very large source, 38,000. The terrestrial and biosphere, terrestrial biosphere, so plants and the soil are about 2,400 gigatons, and our atmosphere is about 830. Okay, in terms of the list I just gave you, vegetation is in fact the smallest, followed by the atmosphere, the surface ocean, permafrost. And remember, we talked about permafrost. That number is not super well known, actually. It could be many times greater because we haven't explored it all our soils, our fossil fuels, our deep ocean, and those sedimentary rocks, okay? So sedimentary rocks being the limestone that is storing large amounts of carbon. Okay, so remember our residence time is the amount of material or the amount in the reservoir and then the sinks in or out. And we can look at how long, for example, a carbon molecule stays in each of our reservoirs. So here is my atmosphere. Here is an example. I have some respiration and decomposition. I'm adding 60 gigatons of carbon to my atmosphere through respiration, and then I'm removing 60 gigatons of carbon through photosynthesis. So would my atmosphere in this example be in steady state? Meaning my reservoir is constant with time. All right. So Steady state is that the amount of inflow and outflow are equal. And so in this example here, I'm bringing in 60 gigatons of carbon to my atmosphere, and then 60 gigatons are leaving. So this example, my reservoir, is in steady state. Okay? 
And we could calculate the residence time of a molecule of carbon in this example, right? So residence time would be 760 gigatons of carbon over the inflow or outflow. Okay, so the inflow or outflow here would be 60 gigatons carbon per year. And that means on average, one of my molecules of carbon in my atmosphere is staying for about 12.6 years. Okay, so where is carbon on Earth? This is a graph from the IPCC showing the size of our reservoirs with the changes due to human activity in red. Okay, so you can see like, for example, fossil fuel and cements and land use change, how that's impacting these fluxes. Uh, and we could also see the major reservoirs in the boxes. Now, when we bring this all together, it gets a little complicated, okay? And this, my friends, is a very simplified, very simplified carbon cycle just for this class. But you can imagine it's actually quite complex because there are so many processes that are moving carbon around to these different reservoirs, okay? So we have our major reservoirs, our atmosphere, surface ocean, life in the oceans, deep ocean, soil, life on land, and our solid earth, including all the rocks and fossil fuels. And then all the arrows here are showing the movement of carbon around to all of these places. And so what we're going to do when we come back from break is we're going to calculate the residence time for these reservoirs, or at least a few of them. All right, so let's go ahead and take a break. Let's meet back at 2.40, and uh, we'll continue on with this. So I'll meet you at 2.40. the residence time of a molecule of carbon in our different reservoirs. So let's try the atmosphere. Let's look at our atmosphere. So when we look at the atmosphere, we know the size of the reservoir is 750 gigatons. What we need to know is the sources in or the sinks out. And so I like to just highlight the numbers in. So in my case, numbers in are going to be respiration. So all the arrows in will be our fluxes in. And when we add those together, that will be the total flux in. And then we can divide our reservoir size by those numbers. OK, so it's going to be. 0 0.6 plus 50 plus 59.4 plus 90 gigatons per year. And we will get, I didn't have this done in advance, we should get 0.6 plus 50 plus 59.4 plus 90. All right. The point six is from the volcanic eruptions. So the volcanic, the line goes all the way from solid earth up to the atmosphere. So if I have all the numbers right, and I have atmosphere. Volcanoes, respiration, respiration. It's okay. And then release. Yeah. So that should be 750 divided by 200. So about 3.75 years. I believe I did that right. Okay. So when you look at these, this is how you do it. You can also do the 
sources out or the sinks out, you could do the same calculations. You would add all of the arrows leaving the atmosphere, which in this case would be dissolution and photosynthesis, which together 90 plus 110 is 200, right? And so this is in steady state and we could do the calculation with either the sources in or the sinks out. So let's just do the surface ocean as another example. Another example, surface ocean, life in the, or no, yeah. Yeah, surface ocean, okay. So our surface ocean, no, I wanna do life in the oceans, sorry. <laughs> life in the oceans, life in the oceans, like our little phytoplankton. We have three gigatons of carbon stored in that reservoir. We have 10 gigatons coming in and 10 leaving. So three divided by 10 gigatons carbon per year is 0 0.3 years. So the average carbon molecule stays in life in the oceans for a third of a year. And that's about right because these phytoplankton, they have a tr kind of twice a year cycle. Okay, questions about doing these calculations? Okay. I promise you'll see this again. So we think about the carbon cycle, the fluxes, right? We looked at the different fluxes or the reservoirs, right? Atmosphere is 3.75 years and our life in the oceans is only 0.3 years. They all have different time scales over which they work over. And so the short-term carbon cycle is what we know as a photosynthesis, okay? So it occurs on short time periods, like twice a year or you know once a year where we have spring taking in a bunch of carbon. And then in, in winter, we have more respiration, okay? So short-term organic carbon cycle, we have a lot of photosynthesis plants using carbon dioxide to produce sugars and carbohydrates. It's important to note that plants do respire all the time, but only photosynthesize during day. So they are giving back a little bit of CO2 to the environment, but net, they are removing more CO2 than they produce. And when we look at the short-term organic carbon cycle, we can see that by taking measurements of atmospheric CO2. So this is our Keeling curve showing the recent monthly mean CO2 or monthly average CO2 at the Mauna Loa Observatory. That's the red dots. Why does the CO2 record have this zigzag pattern. Why is it going up and down? So if we look at 2021 to 2022, we see a peak and a dip. What is happening? Why is atmospheric CO2 increasing and then decreasing in the same year? the seasons, okay? So in 2021, the start, this is winter, we see a peak in atmospheric CO2 in the season of winter. So for reference, Mauna Loa is in Hawaii. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a Northern hemispheric seasonal cycle. So in the Northern hemisphere, plants go dormant during winter. 
They're not photosynthesizing as much, okay? Plants lose their leaves, so they're not doing much photosynthesizing. And then come spring, summer, we see a rapid removal of CO2. We're talking, you know, about four parts per million. It's not incredibly large, but it creates this zigzag pattern. So you are seeing a winter peak when plants are not doing as much photosynthesis in that hemisphere, and then a summer drawdown. Now, if you take the average, if you remove the seasonal cycle, okay, we get the black line. What is the long-term increase? Why is there a long-term increase? The black line, why is it going up? Well, this is measuring carbon in our atmosphere. And our carbon is increasing because of human caused emissions. Okay, so this is zooming in on the carbon. And you're gonna actually do this in your homework this week, looking at the carbon cycle. You're gonna take this real data set, this data set from Mauna Loa, and you're gonna look at it over different time periods, over your lifespan, and think about how much change has occurred over your life, okay? So is our atmosphere now in steady state? If I add a new source to the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuels, is my system in steady state? Yes or no, and you have to type it into chat. No, okay? We are adding more and not taking as much away. And so when we talk about human-caused climate change, there's two main issues. One is the amount we're adding and the rate at which we're adding it. And that is not a natural thing. The system is not ready, can't handle that change. Okay, so now I'm showing you more CO2 data, but from different places on our planet. So this is daily global. CO2. So we take a lot of measurements, okay? So we know for sure what is happening here. The blue is Barrow, Alaska. So a very high northern latitude site that experiences extreme seasons. So you can see in Barrow, Alaska, the seasonal cycle in CO2 is more extreme. The range in CO2 over the seasons is larger because Barrow goes through 24 hours of darkness during winter. Okay, so there's no photosynthesizing if there's no light. So at higher latitudes, closer to the poles, you're going to see a more extreme seasonal cycle in the short-term organic carbon, the photosynthesis. As you move closer to the equator, so Mauna Loa is the red, that's Hawaii, you still have a strong seasonal cycle, but it's less pronounced because Mauna Loa is in the mid latitudes, you don't get as much extreme seasons. Then we have America Samoa, which is right below the equator. And you'll notice that there's hardly any seasonal cycle there uh, because there's really no influence of seasons there. And then we have South Pole, Antarctica in yellow. A few things you'll notice about the yellow What's different about it is the overall value is slightly lower. That's because it takes a few years for carbon emissions in the northern hemisphere to make their way to the southern hemispheric atmosphere. So what we're doing today won't be seen over Antarctica for a few years. So that's why the level is a little lower. The seasonal amplitude is very low because there's no plants <laughs> in Antarctica. Very few plants nearby in Australia and Southern Africa and Southern South America. So seasonal cycle, not as obvious. And another thing is that the timing 
of the seasons is switched, right? Because Antarctica is in the Southern hemisphere, it's going to see an opposite trend where when we have more CO2, say in Barrow during winter, Northern hemispheric winter, it's Southern hemispheric summer, they're in a minimum. Okay, so we can look at these data set and really understand something about that short-term organic carbon cycle. So it matters how close you are to the plants and in what hemisphere you are for the timing of those circle, uh, the seasonal cycle. Okay, but overall the global trend is showing that rapid increase in atmospheric CO2. And the reason we measure CO2 at these random seemingly random places is because we want to remove local influence, right? We couldn't measure CO2 in LA because there's just so many pollution sources of CO2 in LA, right? We got airplanes, we got cars, we got refi uh, refineries, et cetera. So we go to remote places across the planet. So Barrow, Alaska is quite remote. Mauna Loa is remote and high elevation. We get more of the background atmosphere, the same with America, Samoa, and South Pole. Okay, so again, sticking on this short-term short, short -term organic carbon cycle, there's more land in the Northern Hemisphere, so you will see a larger seasonal cycle in that photosynthetic drawdown and increase in CO2 throughout the seasons. And of course, the seasons are switched in the northern and southern hemisphere. So you'll see different timings in those CO2 records. OK, so now we're going to move on and talk about the biological ocean pump, which is how we can store and move carbon in our oceans. So every time you take a breath, how much of the oxygen is coming from the ocean. Every breath you take, how much of that oxygen is from the ocean? Hmm. That's strange. I mean, you could just type it into chat if you'd like. All right, so the answer is somewhere about 50 to 80%. Okay, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, estimates that more than half and they put this number 50 to 80% of Earth's oxygen comes from the ocean. So just like we have photosynthesis on land, we have photosynthesis in our surface oceans, okay? So we think about our marine organic carbon cycle. Here's our food web. Our primary producers in the ocean are our phytoplankton, little critters, our seagrass, and our algae. Then we have you know, the next trophic level up. And so our phytoplankton are the microscopic marine algae that are responsible for producing unreal amounts of oxygen on our planet. And so it's really important that we don't ruin this source of oxygen on our planet because it is important. Okay, so phytoplankton can come in many different forms. We have dinoflagellates, coccolithophores, and diatoms. They're Absolutely beautiful. These are all obviously under a microscope. Um, they're really, really fascinating living organisms. Um, and they're doing a massive amount of photosynthesis. So they're taking up carbon dioxide from the oceans and producing oxygen for us. And phytoplankton are using the sunlight in the photic zone, which is the photic zone is the upper 100 to 200 meters of the ocean surface that receives sunlight, okay? So most of your photosynthetic organisms are going to be found in that area. They need the sunlight. Deeper than that, the aphotic zone, you're going to get your larger organisms like your sperm whales, your octopus, and whatnot. But for us, what matters is this photic zone. This is where we're doing a large amount of cycling of carbon in this 
upper portion of the of the oceans. Okay. Zooplankton are free floating marine consumers. They are not photosynthesizing. They are eating those microscopic plants. They're eating the phytoplankton, these tiny little zooplankton, like little krill, and then other things eat them. Okay, so these are first order marine consumers that are then eaten by other animals. These little things, these little zooplankton, produce fecal pellets or poop <laughs> that fall to the bottom of the ocean, which is one way that carbon can get stored deep in the ocean is through this settling out of these organisms' digestive processes. Okay, so the biological pump is the marine carbon cycle. It is the fact that phytoplankton in the photic zone are taking up carbon dioxide and producing energy, producing the food, becoming food for zooplankton and other creatures to eat. The phytoplankton and the zooplankton, they, the POC, uh, which is um, organic carbon, I can't remember if it stands for primary. I don't remember what the P stands for, but it's organic carbon that sinks down to the bottom. And then we get organic carbon burial in the deep seafloor. Okay, so the ocean is sequestering, removing carbon from our atmosphere and storing it in the deep ocean where it will stay for millions of years. Now, this is not an unlimited cycle. It has limitations. Now, if you remember, our upwelling ocean currents along the sides of our continents are really critical for ocean life, right? Those upwelling currents are cold and nutrient rich, and they're bringing the nutrients and carbon that is needed for the phytoplankton to do the photosynth photosynthesis. And so it matters, we'll see that photosynthesis only occurs in certain parts of our oceans because they need the nutrient rich water. As mentioned, the biological pump is not infinite. In fact, it requires a lot of nutrients like fertilizer, right? If you're growing a garden, you add fertilizer. And when we study phytoplankton tissue, we find this really interesting ratio of nutrient elements. It's called the Redfield ratios. It's the relationship between carbon to nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron in the tissues of the phytoplankton. And it's pretty constant, in fact. So you need a lot of carbon, a little bit of nitrogen, a bit of phosphorus, and the iron. The main limiting nutrient for phyto, uh, phytoplankton is iron. And so there's been some people, some ideas of throwing a bunch of iron as a fertilizer into the oceans to help with this biological pump, to have more drawdown, more sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere to store it in the deep ocean. But it's costly, it's not necessarily super effective, but nutrients are the limiting factor in our phytoplankton, in that biological pump. Now we can look at ocean chlorophyll, right? Phytoplankton are little plants and they're producing chlorophyll. So we can look with satellites for the right wavelength of light that absorbs the chlorophyll. And we can see the average sea surface chlorophyll over this eight year period. And we can see where the higher levels are. And the higher levels are going to be located along the coastlines where there's upwelling and along the equator. Right here is the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Region in the Pacific Ocean, where we, in a normal phase of ENSO, have quite a bit of upwelling. So there's a lot of productivity in our upwelling zones and in the Southern Ocean. We call these enhanced phytoplankton activity, we call those spring blooms, uh, the increase in phytoplankton abundance, and you can see them from space. Uh, it's pretty cool. This is off the coast of um, New Zealand. Yes, and I wanna show you this video here, which shows you 
how amazing these phytoplankton blooms look like uh, and just how much uh, oxygen these phytoplankton are producing. So here's a quick little video from NASA. Scientists have found a massive phytoplankton bloom growing beneath sea ice in the Arctic. The discovery, captured on video and shown here, stunned scientists, as an under ice bloom of this size has never been seen anywhere on the planet. The bloom was spotted last summer by a team of scientists collecting field measurements for NASA's IceScape mission, which explores the effects of climate change in the Arctic. Sampling took place at multiple sites along two tracks of ice-covered water in the Chukchi Sea, just north of Alaska. According to observations, the bloom extended for more than 60 miles from the ice edge into the sea ice pack and concentrated in the top layers of water near the ocean surface. Video footage taken below the sea ice at two different study sites contrasts the Arctic's typically barren and dark blue water with the emerald shades of green produced when teeming with phytoplankton. The blooms consisted mainly of diatoms, microscopic plants that make up the base of the marine food chain and require large amounts of sunlight to grow. Scientists previously thought blooms were limited to ice-free expanses of open water, where sunlight isn't reflected by sea ice and prevented from entering the ocean. But thinning ice and the increase in melt ponds has allowed more sunlight to reach the water below the sea ice in recent years, which may account for the presence of these massive blooms. If such blooms are widespread, scientists will have to evaluate the impact of these carbon consumers on the amount of carbon dioxide entering the ocean and what that means for our changing climate. <laughs> okay, so as Zach mentioned, and they just mentioned too in our video, the Arctic ice is changing so fast, it's getting thinner. And so now these phytoplankton balloons can occur even under ice, which we thought sunlight couldn't make it through. But the ice is now so thin that the sunlight can still penetrate through the ice. Okay, so where does the biological pump get the CO2? Well, it's getting it from the atmosphere, okay? And it's part of this um, air sea flux. So because the ocean is constantly in motion, we have the surface currents, we have waves, that makes a very choppy and turbulent surface exchange. And so the carbon can be dissolved into the ocean, okay? So the phytoplankton are using dissolved carbon that's stored in that upper layer. Now, when the ocean dissolves more CO2, there are effects. So this graph is showing you in red, the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, as you've seen before in our Keeling curve. So from Mauna Loa, we can see the atmospheric CO2 increasing. The green over here is showing the dissolved CO2 in the ocean. So it's called PCO2. And you can see that it is increasing as well. Okay, so more atmospheric CO2 means more dissolved in the ocean. But when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it creates a weak acid called carbonic acid, which affects the ocean by decreasing its pH, making the ocean more acidic. Okay, so here on the right is the ocean pH. So the blue line is showing us the change in oceanic pH over the past 30 years. And it's important to note that pH is in a logarithmic scale. So these changes are 10 times. They're amplified by a factor of 10. Okay, so even though it only looks like the pH is changing by maybe 0.1, it's 0.1 times 10, so a factor of one. So our oceans are becoming more acidic, which will have implications for different sea life. This is showing you the solubility of CO2 in water. And solubility is how easily a gas can dissolve in water. What happens to the solubility or how easily or how well CO2, CO2 dissolves in water as the water temperature increases?
All right. So the ability of CO2 to dissolve in our ocean water is dependent on temperature. And as our oceans get warmer, less CO2 can be dissolved. So the solubility decreases, which is a problem because our oceans are getting warmer, which means the ability for our oceans to buffer some of the atmospheric CO2 increases, excuse me, atmospheric CO2 increases caused by human activity, the ocean is not as strong as it used to be in that. And as the oceans get warmer, less CO2 will be able to be dissolved. So that's not ideal. Okay, so CO2 solubility in ocean is dependent upon ocean temperature. So this one, you can start to see our feedback loops are starting to get a little bit more complex. If our atmospheric temperature increases, well, our water's gonna increase too. That's a positive feedback, or excuse me, a positive coupling. If our water temperature increases, our CO2 solubility decreases, less CO2 can be dissolved. That's a negative coupling. CO2 solubility decreases, and that means that less CO2 dissolves into the ocean. It's a positive coupling. If there's less CO2 dissolving into the ocean, that means there's gonna be more in the atmosphere. Okay, so that's a negative coupling. More CO2 in the atmosphere means our greenhouse effect increases, positive coupling, and our greenhouse effect increases, well, atmospheric temperature will continue increasing. So overall, this is a positive feedback loop. Okay, so right now, when we look at how much of the atmospheric carbon dioxide from human activity, where is it going, right? We can portion it out. Where is it going? Right now, the oceans are absorbing about 50% of the fossil fuel carbon dioxide. Okay, so purple in this graph is the total carbon emissions by human activities. Half of it accumulates in the atmosphere and half is removed from the atmosphere naturally by the oceans. But as ocean temperatures increase, this amount will decrease because the temperatures are warming and the solubility will decrease. So less carbon can get absorbed by our oceans, which means more will go in the atmosphere, which has a direct impact on the greenhouse effect. Right, so carbon in the ocean, not as important for greenhouse effect. Carbon in the atmosphere, very important for greenhouse effect. So where the carbon is, is critical. Okay, so pH is a measure of how acidic or basic a solution is. Completely neutral is a seven on the pH scale. Anything less is acidic. For example, our stomach has an acidity of one, pretty acidic. Then bleach and soap has an acidity of 12, so we consider that basic. And it's really a measurement of how many hydrogen ions there are. pH equals the negative log of the number of hydrogen ions. Anyway, why this matters is that if our oceans are moving from eight downward, they are becoming more acidic. And when CO2 dissolves in water, we produce that weak carbonic acid. And that is going to play out because the pH is really important for critters in the ocean to make their calcium carbonate shells. And I have this demonstration here, which I like, which shows you um, hey, teachers. Oops, the impact of CO2 on acidity in the water. This video is going to demonstrate the bromothymol blue experiment. Bromothymol blue is a pH indicator and it changes color as the pH of the solution changes. When a solution is basic or alkaline around 7.6, the bromothymol blue will appear blue. And when the solution is acidic, it will appear yellow. So we are now going to add some bromothymol blue to a beaker of water. This is just regular tap water. This is our bromothymol blue. 
And what you do is you just squirt it in until you get a nice color. We'll stir it up and you can see that the tap water appears blue and that suggests that um, our tap water is slightly alkaline. So what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate that CO2 can actually alter pH and we're going to get our CO2 by exhaling through a straw and blowing into um, the water here with the pH indicator of bromothymol blue. And as the CO2 enters the water, it will react with the water and create hydrogen ions um, in the equation that you learned earlier. So as we breathe into the solution, the color of the solution should change as the solution becomes more acidic. So let's give it a go. So here you can see that the solution is no longer blue, it's turned a green color. And if I continue, Now the solution is clearly yellow and no longer blue. So indeed, when we breathe into the solution with bromothymol blue, the pH has now changed to acid, um, a more acidic level because of the CO2 that we exhaled into the solution, which- All right, so an experiment showing that impact. So when you add more carbon, you get that carbonic acid, increases the amount of hydrogen ions and makes the water more acidic. Okay, so again, when we look at the pH, as we already saw in our graph here, the ocean's pH is a little bit above the seven, it's at around eight. So it's a little alkaline, but it's becoming more acidic through time. And when we think about increases in atmospheric CO2, that means more will be dissolved proportionally to the solubility change. And we can do see our different scenarios and as we move forward to the end of the century, the ocean pH is, you know, anticipated to decrease to into the sevens, which again, this is a log scale. So the change is pretty great. Okay. And why does it matter? Well, different oceanic organisms have shells made up of calcium carbonate, which dissolve more readily in more acidic solution. So it makes it hard for them to survive or maintain their shells if that acidity increases. So for example, here are some mollusk shells here. And so there's the pH of 8.1. And you can see their shells start to become thinner and more susceptible to breaking when the ocean pH changes even just a little bit. Okay, we'll talk about ocean acidification in a few lectures from now, but that is what we mean by ocean acidification, that the oceans are becoming more acidic because more carbon dioxide is being dissolved in them, leading to that carbonic acid forming. Okay, some other short-term loops in our carbon cycle include things like fires. Okay, so wildfires release both methane and carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Now, What's different though, is that when the plants regrow, they're really only gonna take up CO2. They don't take up methane. So when we think about the carbon cycle, where is the carbon going? Fires are kind of like a net process that some CO2 gets released during the fire, but when the plants regrow and the trees regrow, that CO2 may be negated, but the methane is not and methane as we mentioned, is also a greenhouse gas. Those are all short-term carbon cycle. Long-term, things that happen over millions of years is that carbonate silicate cycle. Okay, so CO2 is removed from the atmosphere uh, when we bury different weathered materials. And then CO2 can be returned back to the atmosphere through volcanism. And this million-year timescale, Okay, so very long-term helps control atmospheric CO2 levels. It is not a cause of changes in our atmosphere today.
Other long-term carbon cycle are fossil fuels. Okay, so fossil fuels is carbon that has been stored beneath the Earth's surface for millions of years. Back in the Cretaceous period, it was super, super warm. We had lots of plants growing. And those plants kind of got stuck in wetlands and marshes, and they didn't fully decompose, kind of like permafrost, except warm and wet. And that carbon got locked into the sediment, and that's what we call fossil fuels. So although we think of fossil fuels as dinosaur bones, it's not actually dinosaur bones, it's plants. And fossil fuels, it's taken them millions of years to accumulate beneath the surface. It's taken time, heat, and pressure for that carbon to become locked into very carbon-rich reserves. Now, what matters here is we're taking those fossil fuels, that carbon that took millions of years to be formed beneath the surface, and we are adding it to our atmosphere, not on a billion year time scale. Million year time scale. I'm so congested, it said billion on my captions. <laughs> a million year time scale. We are adding the CO2 daily on human time scale. And so that is what is important here is we're adding and changing some of these fluxes at a rate that is just not sustainable. Now, as I mentioned, methane is also released from things like fires and it's an important greenhouse gas. So here is the methane cycle and methane is quite different from CO2. It is released from fossil fuels, but it's also released from things like animals. Cows and other animals can release a lot of methane. We also can get a lot of methane from plants decaying in wetlands and in rice paddies, so rice cultivation, which is a huge source of food for many, many people on our planet, is also a large producer, a large source of methane to the atmosphere. And we also have our landfills, okay? So in an environment where there's not a lot of oxygen, decomposition takes place and methane gets produced, just like in our permafrost, that methanogenesis, so one of the ways we can reduce methane production, methane to the atmosphere is to compost and keep food and organic material out of landfills. So carbon, or excuse me, methane is quite a bit different in terms of its overall cycle. But again, what matters is the changes to the cycle that are being made by us, by us and, and our activities, okay? So why is atmospheric methane increasing here is, again, measurements from the NOAA observatories looking at atmospheric methane. It's increasing because of fossil fuels, oil and gas. It's also increasing because more people, more rice cultivation on our planet. There's much more livestock, right? So when you might hear people say one way to reduce climate change is to eat less meat, that's because the cultivation of animals for human consumption, like cow and cattle, it, it, it increase, there's a lot of carbon emissions in that because you gotta feed them and then they themselves during their life cycle process release a lot of methane and our landfills and waste, okay? And just a reminder that methane is released during respiration processes in low oxygen environments like our landfills where there's not a lot of oxygen present because we cover it with a bunch of stuff uh, and so there's a lot of that decomp, decomposition. Okay, so even despite the pandemic shutdowns, which we all thought, oh, people are traveling less, people are commuting less, we'll see a decrease in atmospheric methane and CO2. We did not, okay? Um, it surged because of some of the climate impacts, right? So methane is also released from wetlands, as I mentioned, which are a natural system on our planet. As temperatures increase, some of those methane producers can also increase their rates. Okay, well, if we look at methane through time, this is methane from ice cores. Uh, we can see going back 
2,000 years ago, just how much methane was in our atmosphere is about six to 700 parts per billion. And now we're over 1,800 parts per billion. And you can see that this rapid increase coincides with industrialization right around the turn of the 17th century, or excuse me, the 1800s. Okay, so when we think about methane, this again is a figure from the IPCC showing all of the different sources and sinks of atmospheric methane. Um, there's not a whole lot of sinks in terms of processes, like the ocean is not a sink. It's not removing methane. Methane is mainly removed through chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Okay, so where carbon is at matters a lot. Is the carbon in our atmosphere, is it stored in fossil fuels, is it stored deep in the ocean? If there is more carbon in the deep ocean, the planet is typically cooler. If there is more carbon in our atmosphere, the planet is typically warmer. And we've seen that. And we're going to talk about proxy records, how we can understand our Earth's past climate. We will see that we can see that when there's more carbon in our atmosphere, our planet was warmer. So where the carbon is matters, and the rate of change also matters. Okay, How fast are we adding carbon to the atmosphere? And will the natural feedback loops be able to keep up? Okay. All right, so that's all I have for today. And if you have questions about your homework, I'm happy to answer them now. Otherwise, you're free to go, and I'll see you Thursday, where we will talk about past climate and proxies for understanding climate.